Making Love to Lana Turner. When Sylvia isn't looking, I make love to Lana Turner. My indiscretions occur in the sitting room, in the upstairs bathroom, in the guest bedroom, in the utility room, and in the cloakroom beneath the stairs. Sometimes Lana beckons me into the garden. She pouts her ransom lips, shakes out her luminous hair, and before I know it, I'm crawling indiscriminately among the tangled weeds in search of her succulent physique. Once or twice we have ended up in the garden shed. This morning I'm making love in the kitchen, a place where I seem to find myself for hours on end these days. The climactic moments themselves happen at one end of the new dining table, a beach with six feet are plucked by Sylvia from the B&Q along the edges of our town. Only I do not refer to it as the dining table. Now that I have found a consistent use for it, I refer to it as my desk. Go get your own table, Sylvia says to me, when she suddenly appears, catching me unaware. Shoe yourself, I reply, or there'll be no dinner this evening. Promises, promises, she echoes, and leaves me be again. After we make love, I like to share my thoughts with Lana, particularly in the moments after my final surrender. Lana's indifferent expression tweaks a pang of uncertainty within me. A buried needle comes suddenly to life that prods my innermost concerns. Once Lana's urgent appeals have subsided, I find I cannot cope with the tentative silence hovering over us. At first, I speak without thinking. Word for word, I regurgitate the most obvious utterances, as though still reeling from my initial infatuation. What does a Hollywood legend want with a washed-up timber salesman? Why do my cumbersome charms never fail to impress? Will you sign my poster, I ask, having collected myself after the wild courses of our time together? It is something I ask for every time. At this stage, I am like a broken record. Soon I become braver. I like your flesh, I say to Lana. It quivers, and we begin all over again. Once, after a particularly intense bout of love, <coughs> I implored Lana to run away with me. Running away has always seemed to me a good idea. You know something, honey, she said to me after a lengthy pause. You're about as smooth as an air crash. These are the only words she has ever spoken to me. And from the moment they were uttered, she has shown no interest in anything I have to say. Truth be told, the lady has only one thing on her mind. She is insatiable. Nevertheless, once our pleasure time together ends, I tend to ramble on. I tell her I really liked her in The Postman Always Rings Twice. Her role as a dangerous lady really turned me on, I say. Especially the ocean scene near the end, when she insists on swimming out until she knows she is too tired to make it safely back to shore. Though I like running away, coming face to face with a little danger beforehand, I feel makes escape taste that little bit sweeter. And there and then I share with Lana one of my favourite pieces of wisdom. In order to know the sea, you must experience it when your feet cannot touch the sand, as well as when they can. I also cite our illicit affair as a concrete example of what I am talking about. So I really identify with that scene, I tell her. You are my soulmate, I say. I mention the poster again. Actually, it's more like a large photograph, a black and white screenshot from the movie I had pinned to my bedroom wall long before Sylvia and I took up brains together. Lana is wearing her white uniform. Her hair is kinked at the ends. Her eyebrows are penciled in. There is not one single blemish on her skin. She's standing over her injured co-star, John Garfield, her conspiratorial look lost in the hatchings of a devil's scheme. She could kill with the look in her eyes. I can think of worse ways to die. Eventually, as I knew what happened, I mentioned Sylvia. I'm worried about Sylvia, I say to Lana, cutting to the chase. I barely conceal the desperation in my voice. Out of the corner of my eye, I see Lana give me one of her looks. 
Wake up, you sap, it says. Open your eyes and smell the flowers. But her flinty words are lost on me. Is there something you know that I don't? I find myself asking next. The thing is, since I started making love to Lana, I've noticed that Sylvia has been replacing me with things. Last month it was a dishwasher. Don't you just love turbulent appliances, she said to me. No, I do not, I replied, but she wasn't listening. She was too busy kneeling down beside the sink, her good ear clamped to the sudsy rhythms she had just fallen for. Nor is she confining her attentions to inanimate objects. There has been talk of an Alsatian. What's wrong with a poodle, I offered, and she laughed. She laughed for a good while, and it took some effort on my part to persuade her that my comment was not intended as a joke. Sylvia knows well I cannot tell a joke to save my life. Currently, as she is saving up to buy a horse, she reckons she can pick one up for a couple of hundred euros. I could be a lover of horses, she says, and for once I think she is supplying me with too much information. Today, it is a plant. It arrived an hour ago in a large octagonal pot. It's an Arizona lily, although Sylvia keeps referring to it as the Amazonian lily. Upon its arrival, she placed it on a high stool waltzed home from our local bar one night past. She then stood the high stool by the patio doors, directly by line of vision. Then began a litany of compliments, a litany she adds to every time the thing catches her eye. At least call it by its proper name, I said. I want to call it the Amazonian lily, she replies, flicking the information card bedded into the pot soil. Looking at it, I can't see any reason why the thing should be referred to as any kind of lily. It is nothing more than a pile of glossy leaves. Possibly our garden's exotic nature is imposing a sultry influence upon Sylvia's choice of language. When she addresses the new addition to our household, perhaps she considers the word Amazonian more in keeping with the tropical nettles and petrified toadstools that dominate our little plot. She probably thinks the word lends itself to the garden's flourishing pond life, its immortal bracts of thistle and swampy sounds underfoot. Whatever her reasons, she ignores all my attempts to have her address it by its proper name. Why is it on the stool, I ask? It's blocking my view. The guy at the garden center said the Amazonian lily craves light, she replies, sticking her head into the leaves. Otherwise it won't flower. Of course, I'm just being flippant. My restricted garden view aside, I have another reason for lodging my complaint. The morning is lush with promise, and I'm looking forward to an earthy rumble with land. By the expectant look in her eyes, Lana is in a similar mood. It's too good an opportunity to squander, I tell myself. And Lana's unspoken message is reaching me loud and clear. Get rid of her. Previously, to get rid of Sylvia, I purchased a black and decker. She had been banging on about curtains for the guest bedroom. I want to drill holes, she said. So I took myself to Woody's and picked up the latest model. It has gears and comes with a rechargeable battery. I even threw in a set of drill bits. Immediately, Sylvia disappeared upstairs, and the loudly whirring sounds that ensued allowed Lana and I take our unions to hitherto unknown regions. We shared pleasant gasps, joyful shrieks, and a highly varied selection of situations. Particularly pleasing to my ears was a steady procession of pleas for more. Pleas that seem to draw from the core of the earth itself, from the farthest extremities of ecstasy, if I may be so bold. I really don't know how the table withstood it all. So typical of Sylvia to pick one that will endure. Naturally, there was only so much of this I could take. My stamina isn't quite what it used to be. And eventually, my back gave up. So there I was stretched out across the beach within a useless heap, crumpled up. I was exhausted, my back was aching, and you can imagine the look upon my face when I hauled myself off the table, casually looked up, and saw Sylvia standing at the kitchen door, twirling the black and decker around her middle finger. 
just like a Wild West gunslinger. In the background, I could hear Lana sniggering. This thing doesn't work, Sylvia said. It makes enough noise, I replied, and bounded across to her before she made any sudden moves. Immediately, I noticed that she had it in reverse gear. And when I politely pointed this out, so relieved was she to be able to start drilling holes again, she forgot about all she forgot all about any suspicions my dishevelled appearance merited. To head off future suspicion, I invented chores that involved time in the kitchen. In between bouts of love making, I now cook, scrub floor tiles, and make pot loads of tea. Thank you.